director um, in in business, and I will let my co-panelists introduce themselves. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I'm Leah Holland. They, she, I work with Fight for the Future, which is a queer women and artist led uh, national digital human rights organization. We are, among other things, bandfacialrecognition.com. We do a fair amount of mean girl type work when it comes to calling out uh, invasive and horrific surveillance technologies and working directly with the communities most impacted to make sure that their voices are heard. Uh, this is a very interesting issue to us, one that uh, that we're still getting our legs on and, and being a part of these panels uh, and invited to participate with Amy today has been super helpful and really uh, forcing our very small team to take a deeper look at what's going on here and uh, and polish up our band hammer, as it were, perhaps. So we are going to have a fairly interactive session with you all. If you have questions, if you want to know more, um, the only thing I really have to ask is that you get up and use that microphone in the middle of the room um, so that it can be captured. Um, I know that in this size group, we can sometimes just want to talk to each other, but we still have to, to get people up at the microphone. Um, we're going to start with like, a basic what is neural privacy or neural data um what information might be implicated um and is is neural data the same as thought yeah i in in preparing for this panel i hadn't actually read about the the whole mri thing yet where they were able to put people in an mri and very close to scarily close to read thoughts uh, I, I, up until this point, I had thought that neural neural data was uh, largely collected by Elon Musk sending little like cable tentacles into brains of people uh, and primarily people with severe uh, mobility or other other challenges uh, and in ways that are helpful or transformative for them. Uh, but and reading about putting somebody in an M MRI and having them think a story like the squirrel ran up a tree and an apple fell on my head and have the AI uh, that they're using for this spit out the rat jumped on my head or something like that is close enough for me to say, OK, <laughs> before uh, surveillance capitalism and all of the marketing people that are looking to grab onto this and get the truest, most accurate source of data that they have ever, ever had ever. Um, they, we should maybe uh, take action. <laughs> so it has me, it has me really concerned, but, um, but I, I'm, there's a wider swath than that, but it's starting to look like, yeah, this is thoughts. This is, this is thoughts. This is not something that you have to wear. This is not necessarily something that is going to be happening like with, with your consent in a medical setting here in the next decade, perhaps. And, uh, this is, I mean, to me, it seems like this is the technology that enables, uh, criminal thoughts or crime, crime think or what have you and that enter entry of Orwell's <laughs> wonderful imagination into our reality once more. So just to to read a little bit from the Colorado law that we're going to be discussing and that you all have clearly known about because you're, that's the title of the panel, um, neural data in the definition of the law is information generated by the measurement of the activity of an individual's central or peripheral nervous system that can be processed by or with insistence of a device. Um, so in a second, we'll talk about, and, and Leah has kind of alluded to, um, Neuralink, which is a brain-computer interface developed by um, a company called Neuralink, um, ran by Elon Musk, that has been um, now inserted into two human subjects, and we can go into that a little bit. Um, but it's interesting to me that there are, I would almost divide neural data into two forms. There's neural data that is measured directly from the brain. So if you think about a brain computer interface, um, yesterday I said the panels that I'm on sound more and more like the science fiction I read as I grew up, but uh -huh. they are less and less science fiction. It, it blows like little girl me's mind that I'm sitting here professionally talking about a brain computer interface, but here we are. 
Um, so there, there's that neural data and that can be, um, and what it is today in patients is the, the two patients we believe are both quadriplegic and it's going into the movement centers of the brain. So not necessarily the creative centers or the, um, the pleasure centers of the brain, but trying to figure out where the brain wants you to move your actual physical digits or, or limbs so that it can impact what, what happens with your body. Um, then there is the inferred data about the brain that I think is actually really important to include here. So our organization does a lot of work on immersive technologies. Has anybody here had like worn one of the VR headsets, either the Apple one or the Facebook one? Yeah. The amount of data that can reveal about your thoughts is actually really interesting. Um, and not only necessarily the current iteration, but what is very quickly coming in future iterations where um, they have cameras not only facing out so you can see your environment, nobody wants to trip over a couch while they're in virtual reality. It's very dangerous, don't do that. Um, but they also have cameras facing in so they can measure your micro eye reactions to things as you're looking around the environment. Um, and that can tell a lot about what you're thinking as you're interacting with a 3D space. This is something I'm very interested in. This is something I'm not at all interested in. This is something I might be um, sexually attracted to. All of that information can be read through your micro expression movements, um, which gets also very close to thought. So without even getting into an MRI machine, without putting something in your brain, there's a lot of this inferred neural data um, just from what, it, what shows up on our faces, how we react to things as we look. And so, um, not necessarily in the scope of the Colorado law, but I think if we're going to talk about legislating around brain activity and around thought, it's really important to think before we even like delve into the brain. She described it yesterday as soft set jello, and it was a little bit too early for the like very vivid description that she gave of the brain yesterday for me. Um, before we get into that, I, I think we should think through like there are a lot of different ways that companies can get information about what is happening. In, in your thoughts. Um, so the second question we've already kind of started talking about this is why are we talking about this now? Mm -hmm. Like why are legislators, why are policymakers thinking, oh, we should be thinking about brain data at the moment? Yeah, I think that uh, something that I, I suppose tangentially answer this question that was that came up for me as you were talking about the the micro expressions piece was We've done a fair amount of work uh, with uh, with Amazon employees, warehouse employees specifically, who are um, put on these algorithmic systems of how fast they have to work in order to um, meet the company's standards. It's incredibly fast. How much time they're allotted for bathroom breaks? How many how many bathroom breaks they're allotted allowed, allowed to take? Um, the way that dr not only drivers, but the environment around them are, uh, are, are surveilled algorithmically and judged algorithmically for tra traffic infractions that have nothing to do with the way that the driver was driving, et cetera. And uh, with the pandemic, there's been a increasing normalization of filming your workers of worker surveillance and uh, proliferation of tech companies that purport to accurately judge um, micro expressions or uh, whether you know, whether or not your employees in your shop are maintaining a pleasant face at all times or uh, whether or not they're focused or drifting off in meetings or you know using all of that data from the face uh, to score your employees on what's going on inside their heads uh, or in, in, in their performance as an employee. And a lot of that is complete phrenology. <laughs> it's, it's, it's extremely inaccurate. It's built by companies that are just packaging up some basic software from some other company that like, they maybe even don't know um, exactly how it works and just putting a really good marketing veneer on it uh, in a way that directly impacts people's lives. And, uh, and, and that's really concerning and it's, and it's doubly concerning when you think about, and this is the, this is the thing that I was geeking out with my, my colleague at Fight 
um, w- about this morning over coffee, which is still taking effect, uh, is in the future, like how far that data might go if your employer can ultimately read your thoughts, uh, if it gets accurate enough for them to say, well, employee 716 has had an idea. What is that idea? I think back to a contract that I had to sign for in my previous career where all of the ideas that I generated for the company, even if I just, you know, were with their intellectual property. And yeah, uh, if the company can read my thoughts, like I, I still have the barrier of if I don't tell my employer this idea or that I had this idea at work that perhaps has nothing to do with them. Like I write fiction, you know, I'm, I'm at work. I have a really good book idea as I'm sitting there at my desk or what have you. Um, if the company can read those thoughts, then does anything that I think while I'm at work ever belong to me? Uh, so that's that's very far and away down the road. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and reel it back in <laughs> and return to the original question <laughs> a little bit, uh, um, which was, why are we talking about this? So that's like one example of the trajectory that I see as a human rights person who's looking a lot at the surveillance technology industry and how they're already leveraging our data um, for their gain, their Ill, really ill-gotten gains with bad ideas. Um, but we're here, obviously, title of the panel, because somebody's tried to do something about it here in the U.S. preemptively, which is a uh, it, which is encouraging. I think up until um, we really get to the point of looking at this law and that it might be a little bit insufficient. And I think Amy, your your team has done a lot more specific analysis on that. Did you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I I, I want to digress for a little. So yesterday we I I've alluded to this panel yesterday. The exact um, name of the panel was Neuralink has its first human subject. And I think it's interesting. Um, can I get a raise at how many people have heard of Neuralink? Awesome. So we're not starting. Yesterday, we had a blank room. I said, how many people know what a brain computer interface is? And it's like, we're starting at square one. Um, so between when um, Scott, the director of this session, named the panel, and when yesterday we actually had the panel, the panel was no longer, the name was no longer accurate because Neuralink had already had its second human um, subject. They actually published about it um, on August 22nd, I believe, so only a few days ago. Um, and both people seem to be doing well. Wired earlier this year published a full interview with the first subject, who is um, a gamer. He's able to um, better interact with the games that he's playing. The second subject, again, days ago that we've published about it, um, is playing Counter-Strike 2 already um fairly and beating they said yesterday he's beating his friends which um for a quadriplegic playing counter-strike 2 and beating your friends is actually a really progressive notion that you're playing that well so that was i think going for policymakers, which i think who generally have the um people in congress generally have this reputation that they're very anti-tech and that they don't like technology and having them go from, oh, there's these brain things and that's very far in the future to they are now implanted in two people's brains this year, I think was a stark reminder that we might might be, and I'll, th- I'll talk about this in a bit, a little bit behind on, on keeping up with what is necessary to protect that information as it comes in. Um, never have I seen policymakers move more quickly, never than when they think something affects them. Uh-huh. Um, so there's a case I always point to from 2012. It was um, US v. Jones. And what had happened was um, law, essentially um, law enforcement was trying to track a car without a warrant. They had gotten a warrant, but they were executing the warrant outside of the warrant's parameters, which legally is not a warrant. So it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and they were trying to say, we do not need a warrant to track location information of a car for this amount of time because it's public information. You have no expectation of privacy in that data. And I I still to this day believe the moment they lost that case, which they did, 
um, was when a, a justice looked at the lawyer who was arguing for the government and said, do you think that you could track my car for a month without getting a warrant? And under the government's argument, the lawyer had to say, yes, I do. Um, and, and I think that was the, the pivotal moment. So a lot of this likely comes from lawmakers are seeing this technology out in the wild. They are realizing that this is something that could impact them or their families one day and starting to take action, take notice um, and implement some laws around it. Really fascinating. Um, I want to talk about the Colorado law in detail, but there are a lot of privacy laws in the country at this point. We have in the teens of state privacy. There's no federal comprehensive privacy law. I've said that on every panel I've spoken on. I'm not going to not say it on this one. But there's a lot of state comprehensive privacy laws to the point where um, we're getting really close to half, half of the country with a state privacy law, which is I didn't know if we would ever see that day. It's exciting. Um, is this information regulated as they exist? We have sensitive data. Do we think it's encompassed? Do we think it might already be to some extent protected in these states with laws? I mean, perhaps, but ultimately not in a way that's going to be meaningful to stop the, I guess, you know, like the pr proliferation. We often liken technologies like facial recognition, and I would say this one is even further afield a bit than facial recognition to nuclear technologies, and that it's like something that you really can't put back in the box that will, um, that can fundamentally change our society and how it operates generally for the worse uh we are fighting on 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 many fronts when it comes to the data that's collected from you know our online activities our our messages what have you increasingly from biometrics like facial recognition and and the right to have any sort of 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 privacy um from corporations or governments that extrajudicially leverage corporate data uh, to avoid um, getting warrants or, or subpoenas or or anything like that and really just er erode the crap out of the Fourth Amendment until it's kind of just a, a, like a you know useless piece of paper. Um, and so, well, I think that there might be some cases down the road tested, you know, in court around these around these laws and these issues if the technology gets so far that we have people aware that their rights under these state laws have been violated uh but what that requires is that we get so far afield with these technologies that that's becoming like the, the lived experience of a lot of people and i would rather we do something now before we have those harms and before um all of these like very very wealthy well lobbied interests um become entrenched in the value of this technology for their marketing campaigns because being able to you know as it were read our minds would be extremely valuable to them in terms of trying to sell us crap and i'd rather they not do that <laughs> um yeah come on up yeah, so uh, so I heard that um, I guess I'm kind of thinking about inferred data and the nature of this law. It sounds like does inferred data also count as something like if you infer, like, for example, from a video, can you just not take a video of somebody if they like, does that inferred data count or does it have to be directly like, because I mean, you know, if you're seeing visual input of somebody moving, then that's from their peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. So. So this is really fascinating. And one of the things I wanted to talk about with other privacy laws is something like um, is anybody here from Washington State? Washington, yes, you have very good privacy laws. Uh, Washington State has a new privacy law, new, new, called the My Health, My Data Act. Um, it's been replicated in at least Nevada um, and introduced in other states. Um, you would think by the title, this is a health privacy law. It's called My Health, My Data, um, but it, it it's actually quite broad. Um, the definition of health data includes data from which you can infer health information, um, which is why I want to get to the inferences. So it's not only specific health information, but anything from which health information may be inferred. Um, so if you think about the amount of personal data you have and the amount of ways that could feed into a health condition, um, there are a lot of 
companies that got surprised by the fact that they were going to have to comply with different aspects of this law once they read that definition, um, because it's not facially apparent that that would be included. Um, and so from your, from your brain data, from your face data, like I would argue um, if it's being used for a health implication, that that would be protected under that law. Um, because it's the inference means that the data is protected if it's going to be used to, to make those inferences. Um, so there, there is that piece. The one issue I would flag there is, um, so privacy laws are complicated. Is that accurate? Uh, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it's difficult to regulate privacy. A lot of times it comes back to like, have you consented or not? And that concept of consent is going to come up when we really dive into Colorado, which we will. Um, but it's a short law, so I'm doing a long lead up to a short law. Um, but like, how many of you have actually read a privacy policy before you hit the con yes, I consent button? I, I always ask because I've read them. I work in privacy. I imagine you've read them. Yeah, but not always because life is exhausting and those things are really long. And what do you learn when you read them? Answer yourself and sign away. It's kind of a So we got meant to be tricky. I'm for the camera. I'm going to repeat. Yeah. Badly, do you want the convenience versus what they want from you? The question of convenience versus um, the data that's implicated. Um, I've almost stopped reading them because it doesn't really tell you enough. And if you're going to use the service anyway, then you're not going to not say, yet. like if you've already made the decision um, that this is something you're going to download on your phone or put on your computer, um, or I don't, I guess we don't put in the CD-ROM and do that anymore, but back in the day. Um, it's probably not going to be the thing that says, oh, no, I'm not going to do this. So it, it, many of them are ambiguous. They'll include categories of data, and they'll normally include them as a um, non-exhaustive list. So data such as, um, and leave you to, to figure out what the rest of that data is. They do that on purpose. Like To be 100% fair, it is very hard to write a privacy policy. Um, and figure out all the different types and aspects of data that are collected. Um, I've had to live through this experience just as an exercise, not for an actual company. It is so difficult to get it all on paper. Um, and again, at the end of the day, is it gonna change what you do? So um, consent becomes weird because like, what are you really informed? Is it really informed consent? Are you really, able to like opt out of certain things and not other things? What are you consenting to? It's really the whole package or nothing. Um, but most privacy laws still turn on consent. Um, they do also provide some rights, rights to delete. We spoke about earlier this week, rights to know what data about you is being processed. You should be able to ask and get your profile. Um, there's a very old privacy concept basically says you should, there should be no secret profiles about a person. So if you live in a state with a privacy law, you often can ask companies what they have about you. You can correct the record. These are the rights that we've decided need to be in a privacy law, but they might not be enough for certain types of data. Um, and when we talk about the um, sensitivity, the, dis the ability to connect thoughts to a person, like your personhood around your thoughts, um, it might become at that point necessary to have something very specific on neural data in order to rise to the occasion of the sensitivity of the information. I think that's where we get around to Colorado. Um, and so where were we? Oh, I wanted to talk about security laws. Um, real quick, sorry, um, because I yeah, find I this it. fascinating. Do you yeah. want to? No, you go, yeah, um, yours. This is one of those things that I, I love talking about and I don't get a chance to as often. All 50 states and the, and the territories in the US have a data breach notification law. So if your data is subject to a breach, they have to notify you. But in my mind, an absurd number of them um, are only tied to your credit card information, your social security number, your password, like things that are you want to know if they're breached. Um, but the question I love asking audiences is, 
um, raise your left hand if you would rather have your credit card number breached and your right hand if it would rather be all of the photos on your phone. Like which one would you care more about, the photos or the credit card? And this is in the context of uh, all these AI tools that can now take any photo taken and basically figure out where it is to within like a couple mile radius. <laughs> <laughs> hands have hands have wavered, hands have fallen off. So I always think like we have. Pro I know if my credit card gets stolen. Yeah. I know how to do that. Like, yeah, we can call the credit card company. How many people have done that in the last two years? Like, change your credit card because it was like we got the price. It sucks. You get the credit monitoring. I'm not saying it's fun, but you know it. I don't think we've dealt with what you do if your photos get hacked or your messages or this other information. Um, it's a good luck, Chuck. It's not encompassed by a lot of these data breaches. They don't necessarily have to tell you if that information goes away. Um, and so in those states where they enumerate certain types of information for data breach, and it's not any personal information, we all of a sudden now also have a bunch of security laws that don't account for neural data if that information were to be breached. Um, now more states are starting to take the EU approach with the GDPR, you have to um, notify people if the information is likely to cause harm. So much of a broader standard would encompass some of these messages, photos definitely would encompass neural data and states are starting to go in that direction. But I think too many of them still take the password, credit card number, identification number, in which case we're, we're also seeing no real security protection um, for this information. So now we're gonna get to Colorado. What did Colorado do? Uh, Colorado took their existing privacy law, basically, and added neural data to a subsection of it uh, that specifically applies to only certain things that, Amy, I think you should give us the rundown. You're better at this than me. You've got it on your phone. I do have it on my phone. It's not fair. Yeah, you were showing me it on your phone. I was like, damn, I should have that up. So um, they took, the Colorado took the definition of sensitive data which is defined in the law and said, it's now going to include biological data. And as part of biological data, it will include neural data. And I read that definition, neural data, information that is generated by the measurement of activity of an central peripheral nervous system. We've already gone over that. The problem is, so first of all, the, the requirements under the Colorado privacy law, this has really been promoted as Colorado, brainwave privacy law passed in Colorado, title of this panel, first brainwave privacy law passed in the US. It's been um, in the headlines quite a lot. Um, there are about two protections in the Colorado Privacy Act, special protections for sensitive data. One is you have to get consent. We've talked about that. Um, and two is you have to do, you have to include it in an assessment. You have to basically specially consider about the collection of the data. So already we only have a couple things that this encompasses, requires people to do. That, so that second one is like, you just gotta think about it extra hard? Yeah, write it down. You gotta write it down, Yeah. okay. Um, I'm so encouraged. And, and assessments can change, like okay. assessments actually do give a tool to privacy people and companies to go to the higher ups and say like, here's my legal policy, analytical reputational assessment of this data and what it what harm it could cause do we want to do this um does that always mean that the they decide to do it or like they could go either way yeah, it's like it, here's like the the perceived pot of money that we could make if we do this or we could maybe not do it because there's some risk in, uh, involved and it seems over and over again with other really invasive technologies and rampant data collection that they're you know pot of money That's what people choose um so it is a t it's an important tool but it's it's limited in function um it's i mean it is good to ask you know to be able to go back and ask like hey did you think about this at all so the fact that they have to think about it at all that that is a step in in the right direction um 
And it was, and it is very prescient of these legislators to try to do something, but um, yeah, it's not the, it's not the greatest. It's not the law that I'd pass. Is this a case in which they're thinking ahead? Because usually laws are passed after the fact. So I think this is one of the good things here. We do have them thinking ahead. Yes, which is very new. We are we have been scrambling the you know no federal data privacy legislation, data privacy protection, and not you know in the scale of states, not that many states. Um, the legislators have for a very long time completely failed to think ahead or even catch up with ten even a quarter century ago at this point when we were talking about the delete act and uh and Cal they just passed in california that'd be like a one-click opt-out from data brokers like a do not call list for data brokers essentially like the, we all first learned that that data brokers were a problem uh for abuse survivors when in 1999 there was a 20 year old woman named amy boyer who was shot to death outside her workplace by her a uh, stalker who had purchased her workplace information from a data broker in 1999. And the only thing that's happened is that data brokers have pro proliferated and that has gotten easier and easier to do over time. Uh, so the ability of legislators to move on things that they already know is a threat to life and safety for large swaths of the population is, is pretty, pretty bad. Um, and I hope I want to think of Colorado's actions here as a sign of generational change where we now have lawmakers who understand a bit more about how the internet and how data privacy works and care and see the need to be proactive and that this might be the start of a trend that's really encouraging. So good for them for passing this. Um, it's my job to throw shade on it though. So let's be up here doing. So real quick, just to expand this, because we're talking about Colorado, but actually where we've seen the most action on, on neural privacy has been in Latin America. So to open it up, um, I have a list here. We published a blog post on, on neural privacy in Latin America on the FPF website, if you have interest in going to that. Um, I'm going to read some of the headlines from that, but there's a lot more information here. Um, Chile was the first country to protect mental integrity and its constitution. Um, Mexico has proposed amendments for neuro privacy rights um, to the Constitution, so they're looking to be second. And Brazil not only has proposed constitutional rights for neuro privacy, but also is looking at neuro privacy laws to pass. Um, so those are just three of the countries that are doing quite a bit here. We also have Costa Rica, Colombia, Argentina, and Uruguay all taking action on this. So a lot of movement in Latin America to try to get out ahead. Um, a little bit in Colorado, you know, incremental movement is still movement. And now we're at 1035. We're about over, a little over halfway through and you're all now privacy experts. Can I, can I okay. give that? I can bestow upon you. I, I knight you all neural privacy experts. And I'm interested maybe if we use the next half to say next state is going to pass a neural privacy law. We're Georgia. Sure, sure. Georgia. We're in Georgia. Georgia wants to pass a neural privacy law um, in my hypothetical this room world. Um, and what should be like, what would you want to see in it? We know like Colorado might not go far enough. We've talked about what's in privacy laws and some of the rights and things um, that those contain. What should we be thinking about? Yeah, I'll start it off with the uh, please, folks, feel free to step up to the mic with whatever you got. But I'll start it off with mental the mental integrity thing that was in that you mentioned in Chile. One of the things that I read about that was extremely compelling and so sad was, and, and something really important to think about with these devices and technologies was there was a case of a woman who had really severe epilepsy, who had gotten a brain implant from some company who, uh, that, that had, uh, essentially given her life in a way, a, a life, to live in a way that she'd never been able to live before. And that device in her head became, you know, part of her, her identity. She her, was herself because she had this device. That company then went out of business and they had to take it out of her head. And what she lost was herself. Uh, and I think that that because is- Because of neural networks that 
her brain developed around it, right? Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, the, like your brain would start working with that device and adapting itself to work with that device and the idea that like you like something that is you that is inside you that uh is just owned by some external entity or like licensed to you and then can just be taken out or they can stop making software updates and maintaining it or repairing it or what have you is horrific. Um, and that's a whole other aspect of, of, of having your brain function owned uh, your brain function, your, your, your ability to like work with your body, to do the things that you want to do with your life, your ability to perform needed tasks on your job, your ability to do like brain computer interface work to, uh, for, for your art or for, to make a living or what have you, all of that, um, to be probably, if I think about, you know, the trend with technology licensed, a license for like what's in your own head and how you function in the world, uh, is terrifying. Um, I hate that with every fiber of my being. And so I'd love for our legislators to grapple with that. We have a question or idea. So, uh, Robocop and Ghost in the Shell rubs you the wrong way with all the... <laughs> I actually I really love Ghost in the Shell, but uh, not not for not for that part. Um, okay, so I'm not a neuro privacy expert because I messed the braids for ten minutes. So if these things are not being implanted in our heads because we don't have this stuff, but like, how are they? What's the ways right now that our brain waves or um, the other electrical beats? that happen, how are they being extracted from us without us knowing like what capabilities are there through our smartphones, if you, if you may? Yeah. Yeah. So I think like we, we talked a little bit about inferred data at the start and the thing, cause the, th the things that are happening now are these, you know, may maybe some of them are good and work largely. It goes for me in the bucket of, of like, phrenology of like being able to read your micro micro expressions how your eyes are working when your pupils dilate what you're attracted to all of that from from your facial expressions and then infer your mental state from that there's also a lot of inferences that can be made from social media from ai analyzing your writing from all sorts of uh of, of different like points of data collection like that like that and whether or not any of those are accurate or is a whole other thing. There is also this like blurry outside of HIPAA thing that's going on that's really sketchy with uh, everything from um, uh, the the fake there's a term for these the fake the fake abortion clinics that try to convince you to be a human incubator to the um, to the like mental health apps like better help or what have you who are finding ways to collect data on you outside that isn't protected by hipaa and leverage that to like if you think about like the guided trip apps for um like mushroom trips or what have you that are increasingly out there those aren't covered by hipaa the uh ai therapist ai girlfriend all of that not covered by HIPAA, not covered by privacy laws, and generally actively collecting and selling that data that you're telling to your AI girlfriend or your AI therapist or what have you. And um, and I want to point out that a lot of these circumstances that are being used to infer emotions and mental state and what have you are occurring to people who have a lack of access to healthcare and to other social support systems where there are laws to protect them. Um, and so there's all of that happening and then we can add into it the idea of like they're getting better and better MRI scans. People would love, I, I personally would love to stop typing. I would love a brain computer interface so that I don't have to do this anymore because this hurts and this hurts and this hurts and I, and it's an exhausting and I know eventually my body's going to fall apart. Um, no matter how many granny wit workouts I do. So I think that we're, we're forward thinking on these technologies that people are going to demand. Like if gamers can game better, if they have a brain computer interface, they're all going to want it. Um, and if I can still type and like write novels and what have you, because I have a brain computer head, uh, computer interface when uh, everything hurts too much, and I have too much arthritis, donate to the arthritis foundation. Uh, yeah. So these are, these are some of the, the pieces that are coming together and that you can extrapolate into, into technologies that make that sort of data collection easier and also more of a burden on, tradi on traditionally like 
undervalued, disrespected, and marginalized communities. And we have many more people queued up, so I'll just shut up. Real, real fast, because okay. I think sometimes we think that a brain-computer interface requires actual brain surgery, like putting stuff here. Um, Meta currently, what was that? Well, Meta, so this I find interesting, and, and they've talked about this publicly. Um, this I'm reading a Medium post. Um, Meta, formerly known as Facebook, is developing a wristband um, so something that you could potentially wear with your watch or wear separately from your watch um, that uses, and this is why I'm reading it, electromyography, EMG technology, um, to interpret neural signals to control your digital devices. So really reading what signals you're sending to your hands, no surgery required, put something on your wrist. It can help you figure out, like, do I want to swipe on this thing? And rather than having to actually swipe on it, um, that movement is registered. So there are very non-invasive technologies already being pushed toward the market, um, able to read and interpret neuros. Neuro and, and then all the wearables that we have, blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate, all of that, like all of that um, too is, um, implies emotional states and... Totally, yeah, next question. Okay. Um... Yeah, sorry, I don't know if this is mentioned. Or statement. Or <laughs> right. <laughs> the first 10 minutes. But what happens when the person dies with this device, right? Do they, does that original company, do they take the data back? Is it just dead, gone, or what? Oh, I'm here for this question. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, <laughs> so, so, like, what happens when a person who's been using one of these technologies dies? It, it is fascinating to me because I I was in a discussion about this a couple of weeks back and there was a there was a man who said, well, I would just want to donate it to science. Like, why don't they just have all of my data and all of my thoughts and then they can study it and what ha have you. And then all of the um, younger people around him immediately were like, well, what about all the data in your brain about people that aren't you? And that's one of the biggest pieces that uh, that we're uh, beating up on Amazon about right now at Fight for the Future is, yeah, people install these ring cameras that face out onto the streets and film literally everybody who walks by, um, everybody around them's daily routines, like what time does the kid walk to school? What is the kid wearing? What does the kid look like? Um, and there's no consent for bystanders and in and, and the same way that there is no consent in your thoughts and memories for the people that you have from the people that you have those thoughts and memories about and that uh is potentially like extraordinarily invasive and damaging like every memory that you ever have of another person um our ability to keep secrets for our friends and loved ones are are just not to share like our intimate relationships or what <laughs> um, so what happens to those devices and the data associated with them after the people, after a person passes and who owns it is actually like a huge issue. Uh, I think that, um, and then there's, there's like, there's like a, a, a whole, like maybe a waste disposal question or what have you, when it comes to like, if you got some lithium battery, something, something that like, maybe, you know, like we don't want to cremate that necessarily. <laughs> Uh, like, like there's some practical considerations there. Uh, I think mostly about the data. Um, and I think that different people who have different conceptions of what happens after you pass and how your bodily integrity and the pieces of you of which these machine may be like a, 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 a truly meaningful and important part to you spiritually. That's another huge question that we don't have a lot of answers to, but that's a really, really important important one to ask yeah because i kind of feel like that basically you know, if i pass i'm like oh well this guy tj huh, he had thoughts how he did not like his neighbor because the dog hooped in his yard i'm gonna write an evil documentary about this guy to destroy his character so now i'm dead and gone he took the data and it's like oh well i, I won grammys because i can take memories from people who are dead they can't do anything so that's the scary part that somebody can have access to that and do whatever right so yeah, my novelist brain with this one earlier was like when I was first thinking about this was like, oh man, there's some good stuff in here. <laughs> I don't think this, I don't think this was covered. But what are the penalties under the Colorado law? Is it all civil? Are there criminal? Do you think there should be criminal penalties for companies violating, et cetera? Um, so they're they're not criminal. They're civil, um, and it's enforceable by the attorney general. 
So this is um, a distinction with different laws. Some laws, um, privacy laws have a private right of action. The Washington law I talked about has a private right of action. Illinois has a biometric law with a private right of action. Um, but most of them are, are centrally enforceable by either a regulator or the attorney general, um, as is the Colorado one. So the attorney general's office would have to investigate um, and, and enforce against a company that has violated the law. And uh, Fight for the Future is an abolitionist organization, so we don't support criminal penalties for anything. Next question. Yeah, cool. So I, I had a statement um, about the question you asked about the law, like uh, new law. So I think that I would like to see um, more stuff about actual what the psychological things that we're trying to keep private are instead of necessary. Because, because for example, like if you have uh, a social media app that tracks your attention and stuff that you're interested, in, that, those have been around for like a long time. And um, I don't think that I want a social media app or company knowing like what my interests are like that. I mean, I like having recommended stuff that, that I find interesting, but I, I don't like having something that's extremely effective at trapping my attention and trapping the attention of people, other people. So um, I guess that I'd like to see more rigorous definitions of, of um, the purposes that neural data is gonna be used for and what actually constitutes neural data. Cause I, I feel like what's already been defined in, in uh, at least in the Colorado law sounds really nebulous and sounds like a lot of stuff falls under it that's not gonna be enforced. And I don't want to see um, a default to like non-enforcement because it's so nebulous. If that's how it works, I don't know how the legal system works. <laughs> um, if people are interested, actually, there's a, a defunct now podcast called Reply All. Um, if anybody has ever heard of that, it was on for a very long time. Um, and they had an episode almost right before they discontinued called Gleeks and Gurgles. Um, I'll never forget the title of this episode because it was such a weird one. But they really delved into what is necessary. Essentially, one of the people on the podcast had a, a very rare medical condition, and they were starting to get content related to that medical condition. They couldn't figure out how that determination had been made. And so the podcast is a deep dive into like, how are we determining and inferring things from social media content? It is really a fascinating. They don't necessarily reach a definitive answer because there are many possible answers, but I would recommend that to you all if you want to continue to do a deep dive into that question. Um, first of all, I'm old as dirt, so I've seen a lot of this evolve over my lifetime. And it's very scary because, as I said before, with the idea of convenience, most people seem to be willing to sell their souls for convenience. Oh, yeah, we'll just sign off on it. But even if they don't sign off on it, and even with all these laws, I kind of feel like I'm somewhat of a skeptic because I don't feel, I feel like the companies are going to find a way around it because capitalism and money, and that's what makes our, that's the way we've set it up. So, but I am very encouraged, I have to say, because I see people of your generation and the generations that have come after me that seem to be interested in doing something about combating this. That's very encouraging. I wish all of you luck because it's very scary. I think we've sort of, um, we're contributing to our own demise in a sense because, you know, we want convenience and, you know, everything's about money and whatever. But I just wanted to say I am very encouraged to see the su successive generations be so proactive about this. Yeah, that um, one of my notes for this panel uh, was very much along that line that uh, this this sort of work when it when we take it outside of helping paraplegic quadriplegic people people. Um, who who would like that sort of uh, that sort of assistance to use their bodies in the ways that they desire um and you think about the marketing of you know like we're going to make gamers game better we're going to make like keyboard warriors keyboard better or 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 what have you um and i've seen a real and this is in like generations below mine to a large extent but i think you know i, I feel like proudly enabled by by millennials that uh that there's like more naming of like that it's really like in, in, in insidious to create a culture that's so like toxic and rejecting 
of rest or slowness. Um, so unacknowledging of like the fact that like the individual worker productivity has skyrocketed uh, over over the past decades with with no um, corresponding increase in 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 pay or support or you know adjustment to like a shorter work week because we are, will still with a four day work week do more far more work than um, than the previous generation within the time that uh, with, with, with less hours or what have you like the demands on us just keep pressing and pressing and pressing um, and uh, and the you know like and we're just trying to make our bodies keep up and that is exhausting and toxic and and like this technology is being presented you know as solutionism to the idea of like we need to go faster or as 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 a way to enable us to go even faster when our bodies want us to slow down <laughs> the earth wants us to slow down and uh and, and we don't need another band-aid what we need to do is is to be changing these these toxic cultures and values and um and and i think that there's like a there's a large place for leadership from older generations particularly as they uh, as 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 they grapple with the effects of what it is to like have lived this way um and and looking back at a life that had room or maybe like towards like like in la latter decades has had less and less room or children and family members who have less and less room for the things that are more valuable and to be really naming and advocating for more space for rest, less acceleration <laughs> in terms of the, of the demands that are being made upon us and, and, and maybe rejecting these technologies from, from, from that perspective. Uh, so that's my rant on that right with you. Um, all right. So everybody, of legal age at some point has broken a law, uh, whether it's a traffic law, whether it's whatnot. Uh, has I there maybe been... shouldn't say this on camera, but uh, I jaywalked on my way I'm over a, here. I am perfectly <laughs> willing to admit that. I'm not going to tell y'all what. Uh, that's going to be up for you know future technologies to discover. Um, has there been any governmental or legislative interest in being able to use this information to convict of crimes without actual physical evidence? So this technology, I'm, I'm sure there is, I'm sure there will be, I'm sure that that is being talked about privately. I'm sure there are military applications for this that are being discussed. And then of course, immediately going to be deployed on civilian populations. Cause that's what we do with military technologies in the post 9-11 world. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm sure that all of that is coming because we've seen it happen with other technologies there is a sort of pre-crime type department um that that exists in some law enforcement contexts already like for there's for a number of years please i think it's in miami dade um have been using an a uh, crime prediction algorithm to tell them who to go and bother yeah. over and over again <laughs> in their communities who's like more at risk of of committing a, a a crime based on whatever statistics this algorithm has and and we know and and, and because it's like te uh intellectuals uh, what what's the term like it, it's it's trade secrets it's trade secrets what exactly is in the special sauce of this algorithm that this like big like military tech company is selling them we don't actually know how they're making those predictions and like how good like the the build on that algorithm is but what we do know is that there's there's like even teenagers in this community who the cops just go and visit every week because they've been specially selected as like a committer of pre-crime or what have you and uh and and like throughout the country there are um there's a panel later today on police foundations here at 4 p.m that i highly recommend um because that police foundations are one of the ways that these like unvetted untested technologies make it into the hands of of law enforcement without any sort of oversight from government or um accountability to the public uh so 
I, I I would bet you that like there's at least one out there probably now that is selling some aspect of what we're talking about today um, and, and trying to get that um, out to police departments or corporations. So uh, uh, yeah, I'll be suspicious of the knock on my door at 2 a.m. When um, when. We have warrants. Everybody has heard of a warrant. There's also a super warrant that police have to get. It's written into law if they want to do wiretapping. So specifically what happened was Congress recognized that for live collection of communications, there were unique and special threats. And so we should go beyond what a traditional warrant requires to say, here are some additional requirements. And we can do that within law. We can go above the, the limit set by the Constitution. Um, one thing that we've talked about, for instance, is if hacking operations should require like a super, super warrant, um, perhaps getting neural data should require an extra warrant. So there is space here at this point to say certain types of searches, certain collections of data should require additional protections, should require police to show more things before they can get access to that data. Let's write that into law. Um, and some of those conversations have started in different ways, but we really need to move yeah. that up a little bit and and we also have the opportunity as new threats catch the idea the attention and imagination of lawmakers to renegotiate how we think about dealing with these technologies and this is a spot where i get a lot of hope like legislators are terrified of ai uh and that is going to drive them to action perhaps actions that could actually be good for all of our data privacy and handle um, the threats of AI in a much more modern way that takes into account how the internet and data actually work and move um, through through our lives and uh, and all of the the series of tubes. But, uh, and I think with neural data too, there's the opportunity to renegotiate, perhaps it's not only get a warrant um, for neural data in the sense of getting a warrant today, which is either you like go get a warrant or you can go buy it from a data broker or extrajudicially with a subpoena or anything. It's get a warrant and you can't buy it from a data broker. And we were going to collapse the ability for there to be markets created of our neural data because that is dangerous. That is something that you should only be able to access with a warrant, no matter who you are. That should only be collected for specific purposes. So this should be protected by HIPAA, but what are the ways that HIPAA doesn't go far enough? Um, and there are plenty of ways that HIPAA doesn't go far enough. And so as, as these technologies evolve, it gives us the ability to bring new concerns and to, to renegotiate um, with lawmakers who are you know, scared shitless of Last of minute. what might be done yeah and we're basically out of time so one more question that's cool um all right so when you were talking about the uh ways that's that it was being collected about this woman um it was uh not very clear how it was being gathered uh made me think actually other things so it's not so much about pre-crime right or or criminalizing somebody that can be concerned because that's too obvious right so perhaps the problem more is our ability to choose agencies uh, because the powers that be that have this want data to know how to pretty much consume or use this as a safari to, because everything's consumerism really today. Um, so to what extent do you think our agencies would be given up? Wouldn't that be like also determining who is gonna be employed uh, and what factions and what responsibilities? I mean, perhaps even a game could collect that data based on what decisions we make. I guess I'm not very clear. Yeah. So what agencies do you think would be quick to be taken away? Uh, the ones that are already being taken away by the sort of data collection that you're talking about. There's a huge proliferation of employee assessment or risk management software or what have you that's already using the best swaths of data collected on us to make judgments about housing and employability and, and healthcare and, and all of the above. And those are only being accelerated by AI and neural data is just one more input to that. Uh, and, I, and, and one that is very scary and that may provide us the opportunity to renegotiate the way that these technologies are already being uh, misused and leveraged unfairly to deny people um, their human rights. So I I am hopeful, particularly hopeful, looking at Colorado actually doing something in all the countries in Latin America doing even more now um, in advance 
before this thing is is has has taken taken hold uh it's it's really encouraging even if the subject matter is pretty dire so this is a great segue into saying the next panel on the electronic frontiers track is on ai regulation and we will talk about how ai regulation is specifically targeted to consequential decisions it is down in the crystal ballroom on the first floor of the hilton um i am asked to remind you all to in this teeny tiny language to rate this panel on your dragon con app um the two of us would greatly appreciate it um and i am going to sit up here right before i head down to that ai panel um if any of you want to come up and talk but thank you for joining us on this saturday morning thank you all so much thank you.